Okay. Um, and we will share the recording with you so that you go, can go back and watch this later. During this session, you're muted and you're also not on camera. The other participants cannot see or hear you doing, during this time. There is a chat button, but uh, instead of using that, we'd like you to use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen if you've got questions. Simply press the button and type in your question. We have several staff who are reviewing your questions and uh, we will answer these at the end of the presentation. If you see a question that you really want answered, you can also upvote that question too. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible, but in the interest of time, we may consolidate some of the questions or uh, into similar themes or topics. This is a fairly new program for us, and we really want to make sure that what we're doing is really useful and effective for you, our residents. Um, so there will be a brief survey at the end of this. It will either open up automatically when I end the webinar or when you leave the webinar. We're going to try to save about five minutes at the end of the webinar to give you time to do that survey. And now, oh, one last feature of Zoom. Um, if you would like closed captioning, there should be a button at the bottom of your screen that will enable closed captioning that will transcribe the words that we're saying. And now I'm pleased to introduce Bob James, who is a Kitsap County Master Gardener. Welcome, Bob. Uh, thank you, Cami. Uh, I'm Bob James, uh, as Cami said, a Master Gardener for Kitsap County, and we're going to talk about natural lawn care today. So first slide. And then next slide. So the first thing to ask is, so why go natural? And as the slide talks about here, we overuse pesticides and fertilizers pretty significantly for our lawns. And when I'm talking about pesticides, I'm talking about both herbicides and pesticides, kind of a, a joint term to encapsulate both. Uh, you can see this contaminates our waterways, uh, algae blooms and problems with deoxygenation in our Hood Canal or other areas. And there's a number of steps being taken around the country to limit the amounts of fertilizers that are getting into our waterways and pesticides due to these problems. This can harm fish and wildlife and other side effects such as not being healthy for our kids and our pets who of course love to play on our lawns. Another thing is you can save money and also be more effective in our water use, which is a positive for environment. Uh, if you're using a natural process with really healthy, vigorous lawns, you should not have to water as much. And I think right now we overwater. In fact, about 60% of the water use on the West Coast is used for lawns, and, and that's a significant amount. And then as I was saying earlier, a healthy lawn requires less care. We want these healthy, vigorous, self-sustaining lawns, and that helps crowd out weeds and requires less resources and time on our part. So next slide, please. So how does nature sustain a grassland? And this is, if we're gonna do go natural, so how would mother nature do it? And how has mother nature done it in the past? So I posed this question to some of my horticultural friends and they've got a lot more experience than me. And we brainstormed and thought, you know, the Great Plains had some of the most fertile soil in the world. And you had these huge herds of bison and antelope and, and other herbivores, which would uh, roam around and they would be, well, doing their business, providing manure to the landscape. Their hooves would aerate the soil. Their chomping would mow the soil or mow the grass and would also be a little bit messy. So a lot of that waste from their, their chewing and chomping would leave grass down as a compost, which builds the soil. So all these things were key to maintaining and building this grassland. And periodically you would have wildfires. And this is a natural way of adding biochar to the soil. And biochar is actually helpful because it does help to make soil less acidic. And grass, as we'll see later, likes soil that is less acidic. So we'll talk more later, but you can see how mother nature had some mechanisms that helped develop really great grassland. And the six steps that are developed for a natural lawn care really model mother nature steps as well. Next slide, please. Where to start? And I think it's worthwhile understanding your location, your yard, your soil. 
recognizing that in the Pacific Northwest overall, it can be more difficult to grow grass than in other parts of the country. We tend to have very wet winters and very dry summers. And obviously lawns like to have some water in the, in the summer and too much wetness can lead to funguses or root rot. So that can be counterproductive. Also, we have a lot of tall conifer trees which lend to shade and most grass likes more sun. So understanding your location is important. If you're going to get um, start or buy grass seed, excuse me, look for the right blends. And a lot of our stores, our, our uh, nurseries and other gardening stores will have Pacific Northwest or PNW blends, which are more designed for our area. Uh, rye and fescue types of grasses are often prime in those types of blends. Also, there are some blends which are targeted for more shady areas. So get the right grass for your location. Next is, what is your soil? How healthy is your soil and what is the pH? And also a big picture look at compaction, compaction of your soil. So testing your soil is simple to do. There are simple test kits that you can obtain, especially to determine pH. Just as a big picture, our native soil is normally about 5.5 on a pH scale. Now, lower pH numbers are acidic, higher numbers are basic, and seven is neutral right in the middle. So 5.5 is pretty acidic, and that's most of our native soil. A lot of our soil around our houses, which is mostly fill dirt, is more in that 6.0 range, and 6.0 to 7.0 is the optimum for growing grass. Compaction, Compacted soil will tend to remove air from the root zones, which makes it tougher for the roots to pick up nutrients and other uh, minerals. It also makes it more difficult for water to drain and percolate down through our soil to get down to the roots. You can wind up with compacted roots and compacted soil, and then the water may just run off the top. And nutrients. We want healthy, vigorous soil to support healthy, vigorous lawns. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are three prime nutrients that are normally identified in fertilizers with three numbers that'll be separated by a dash. The first being nitrogen, then phosphorus, then potassium. As a big picture, if you're going to establish a new lawn, you need nitrogen and phosphorus. But for an established lawn, a lawn you already have going, you don't need much phosphorus, if any at all. So look at the fertilizers you're using. In fact, many fertilizers are, are sometimes there are laws that say that you can't apply phosphorus to your lawns if it's already an established lawn. So understanding your soil and your environment, your microclimate is important. And then follow the six natural lawn care steps, which we'll proceed to outline as follows. Next slide, please. First, mowing. You want to mow higher, so leave about two to three inches of grass height there. And mulch, use a mulching uh, lawnmower if possible. That mulch that gets chopped up, those grass clippings are a natural compost that helps build your soil over time. And so that's a great way to, to help your grass grow and build the soil. Also, when talking about the mowing height, you don't want to cut off more than one third of, it, of the total height of the grass at a time. If you do more than that, you're almost shocking the grass. You can cause it to respond by wanting to grow quicker because obviously photosynthesis with the leaf blades happens. And if you take away all that photosynthesis ability or too much of it, the grass is going to want to respond to obtain it and regain it. Also mowing regularly, normally about once a week at this level, gets the grass into a particular mode where it's in a band of heights and wants to spread. And we want our lawns to spread with vigorous roots so they fill in any blank gap areas and also push out any weeds or remove the ability for weeds to take hold. That's called encouraging lateral growth. Next slide, please. Please use natural, organic, slow-release fertilizers. 
add only what your soil needs. And this goes back to the earlier slide that says test your soil to see what you need. Fertilize appropriately based on your tests. Normally the best times to fertilize in the fall or, the, or in May. You want to fertilize in May because that's a little later in the season so that you're not encouraging so much growth early on that you're just having your grass or growing a lot more grass that needs to be mowed. Fall is a great time to fertilize because then that forces more good root development because you have some good rains in the fall and that you want to build up the robust nature of your lawn for the next year. So build soil health instead of relying on soil supplements. Compost leaf, clippings, biochar. Next slide, please. Slow release fertilizers are recommended because if you're giving your fertilizer either in the fall or in that May or spring time frame, you don't want a massive burst of fertilizer at once because your grass can only uptake so much of that fertilizer. The rest of it is just going to get washed away into our, into our waterways and that is not helpful. It's actually counterproductive. Slow release fertilizers release the fertilizer over time at a more appropriate rate where the grass can uptake those nutrients over time. It's more economical as well, more efficient. So please use slow release fertilizers. Okay, next slide, please. Water deeply and less frequently. Um, this concept applies to basic trees and plants as well. You want to develop strong roots, an extensive deep root system. Then the grass can handle periods of drought better and there's less opportunity for disease to develop. If you're watering all the time, then the grass is continuously wet, which is a better environment for disease and fungus to come into play. And we want to prevent that. Lawns only need about one inch of water per week in the summertime. So if you are going to water, then do it just once a week. That actually, if you spread out the times, then the grass will have to develop more roots. You're stressing a little in between waterings, but by watering deeply, you're getting that root development. One way to determine how much water you're applying, i.e. the one inch metric, put out some little cans like tuna cans in your lawn when you run your sprinkler and you can time how long does it take to fill up one of those cans because they're about an inch deep. And that gives you a good go by for how long to run your, your sprinklers. And of course, we all have different water pressures in our houses. So you got to understand how your water system works in applying water. Another option is to just consider letting your lawn go dormant in the summer. That is very natural for lawns. When it's very hot, they go a little dormant. They kind of conserve their energy and they come back like gangbusters normally in September in our area when it starts raining again and they're green and lush at that point. Another consideration, water in the early morning or in the evening to avoid evaporation loss. If you're going to water and a good portion of it is going to evaporate right away, that's not the most efficient way to do things. Next slide, please. Aeration, overseeding, and compost. So when I mentioned earlier about soil compaction, there, it's healthy to have a certain amount of air present in the soil. And aeration, is, there are some machines that can be rented or if you own one, or you can have landscapers go through your lawn to aerate and kind of puts these little plugs that allow air to mix down into the soil. That helps root development, that helps the penetration of water when you do water, and it also serves to break up the buildup of a heavy thatch layer. Thatch are old root systems or old bases of, of grass that have died back, and if you have more than, I think it's like a, a half inch of thatch, then you want to de-thatch. There are also separate machines you can rent or have your landscapers um, use to specifically dethatch a lawn. And often it's good to consider dethatching or aeration once a year for your lawn if it's needed. Also, overseed your lawn with that appropriate blend, as mentioned earlier, to reduce your barren 
patches. September or April, May are great times to overseed. And here we're just trying to fill in those bare patches with some fresh grass to grow. Top dress with a quarter to a half inch of compost. Uh, adding some biochar to your compost would be great, but any type of organic compost to just build basic soil health. And this should reduce your need to add phosphorus, nitrogen, other fertilizers. In fact, you shouldn't have to add phosphorus to an established lawn. Next slide, please. If at all possible, please avoid using weed and feed. Uh, integrated pest management is a process of trying to defeat weeds and pests by using the least invasive or intrusive process that you can to defeat these pests. Um, some simple things you can resort to, hand weeding, or also tracking what types of weeds you have and if you can go through and prevent them from going to seed, you're, you can over time win the battle to force these weeds out as you enhance your vigorous lawn and you kind of beat back the weeds themselves. You want your lawn to crowd out the weeds and that includes moss. If you have a vigorous lawn, it will crowd out moss as well. If you need to use some type of pesticide or herbicide, uh, we rep, uh, recommend that you just do that in uh, certain situations by spot spraying targeted areas. Doing a, a wide broadcast of these type of chemicals, a lot of that, most of that is going to get washed into our waterways and you're kind of overkill by doing that all at once. Another part to integrated pest management when you're trying to take out pests in particular, sometimes a pesticide will wipe out a certain pest that you're trying to take care of, but then nature follows through where that pest comes back even stronger because it responds by reproduction because you don't get all the pests. And often the pesticide will take out the good uh, bugs and critters that will go after the pests and control the pest population. And normally those carnivorous type of stuff will take longer to come back and take out your pests. So please be very careful about using weed and feed products. Next slide, please. And this amplifies the uh, downside to using weed and feed. Average suburban lawn, we use a lot more chemical pesticides than, than farmland. And if you're kicking out a lot of your earthworms, then that's going to be counter to developing that great soil that you want to develop. And as mentioned earlier, pesticides certainly can't be helpful for our kids and pets or the environment. Next slide. Consider lawn alternatives. And I, I wanna preface this, I'm not saying get rid of your lawn, although there's some situations where for some people it is best to get rid of their lawn, that's okay. But for most people, there are tremendous benefits to having a lawn and it's great for, for the kids to play on and your pets. I have a lawn myself. But looking at your lawn or your yard and determining which areas are optimum or better for growing a lawn and which areas, is it a struggle because they're shady or on a heavy slope and it's just not the right area for a lawn. If you are trying to grow grass underneath a cedar tree, normally it's difficult to grow anything except some native, native salal under a cedar tree. You're going to be fighting that a lot because it's just normally naturally acidic soil and it doesn't get a lot of sun. That's a struggle and it might be better to go and use some sub salal or some type of native ground covers or some things that are more akin to growing under a cedar tree. Other areas may be compacted because of heavy traffic. Maybe putting some pavers in those areas would be helpful instead of trying to grow grass. And last, as a lawn alternative, we do want to protect our waterways. And so having some type of buffer between our lawn and waterways reduces the chance of fertilizer and pesticides getting in those waterways. So consider that alternative. Slopes also can be difficult. It's kind of tough to mow on a heavy slope and getting any of your water to stay on the slope and actually penetrate without running off. Same for other fertilizers. 
So maybe there's some alternatives that can be put like some ground covers on a slope. Next slide, please. And maybe just live with some of these items like moss. Moss is really not harmful and it's green. And so actually in my yard, I actually will mix some uh, clover seed in because clover is quite well and it will grow and fill the gaps in my lawn. And if there's some moss there, I think that's fine. I just let it go. So maybe some accommodations can be made with nature and with our grass. Okay, next slide, please. So that concludes going through the six steps for natural lawn care. Now I'm open to answer any questions you might have. So folks, if you have questions, go ahead and drop them in the Q&A below. Um, and I'm gonna ask a question while we're um, letting folks chime in with their questions in the Q&A. Um, Bob, I've been hearing in a number of places about biochar lately, and I will confess that I'm not very familiar with biochar. Can you talk a little bit more about what it is and how to apply it? Certainly. So biochar is really just uh, burnt carbon matter, wood. So burnt down to being essentially charcoal and you're adding carbon to the soil. Now, there's actually a lot more to it because there's a lot of scientific study being done to how best to develop or make biochar. And sometimes the best biochar is actually done into controlled circumstances under some pressure where you, you're burning it, but it's also pressure. Uh, biochar is also something that's relatively new over the past probably five or 10 years, but there's still a lot of research being done to determine which situations is it really helpful and which situations is it not helpful. And there are certain applications where it does help. And I mentioned earlier that it does raise the, the pH of the soil or reduce the acidity. And in a lot of applications, that would be helpful. Um, you can also uh, reduce the acidity of the soil too much. You can go too far. And the, from a technical point of view, acidity of the soil, different plants are developed evolution to uptake nutrients in certain acidity conditions. And if your acidity is not right for your plant, then your plant is not able to efficiently uptake nutrients from the soil through its roots. Basically it's being starved. And so you wanna have the appropriate pH level for the appropriate plant. And our lawns like it to be 6.0 to 6.7.0. To so slightly acidic, but really neutral. Oh, you also asked about how to apply biochar. So uh, biochar is just like, it's really carbon dust. So, you know, you can spread it by hand. You can spread it in a, um, a spreader. There's certain machines that, you know, will just spread out biochar. But if you're spreading it with a machine, be very careful. Uh, look at the instructions on whatever packaging you're getting. Uh, you probably want to wear some type of respirator or at least a mask because it's a very fine dust and just like uh, coal dust, you don't want to be inhaling that. So uh, observe any of the warnings on the labels for where you get the biochar and uh, or Google on the best means of applying it. And, and it's probably good to just apply some water to it afterwards because after you put a thin layer of biochar out, you'd probably want to wet it instead of having the winds blow it away and continue that problem. So a couple of thoughts on biochar. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question here that asks, is it possible to balance clover and grass without the clover taking over completely? Yes, most definitely. Um, I know in my yard, the clover has not taken over. It's clearly some areas it seems the clover seems to like better and other areas the grass is, uh, is pretty much dominating. Um, one thing you can do, so I, I mentioned earlier about weeds and not letting weeds go to seed. So you're trying to combat your weed growth. So if you're worried about your clover becoming too dominant, you can cut it and prevent it. You know, once it goes to flower, cut it. So it's not able to go to seed. 
I actually go another path. I am more careful and will mow my lawn net less or not mow around the clover when it's flowering because I try to encourage it to go to seed and to do its thing so that it's kind of healthy and, and perpetuating itself. But if you're worried about the clover taking over, cut it back so that it doesn't go to seed and, and that can kind of limit it as well. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna pause for just a second to see if anybody else wants to drop a question um, into the Q&A. And maybe what I will do um, is just point out on the screen, folks, if you are interested in getting more help from Master Gardeners, we've got the websites there. You can also use the QR code, which will take you directly to our Kitsap County Master Gardener webpage. And I'm going to go ahead and take us to the next slide. But if I see another question pop in the Q&A, we can always pause and answer that. So I've got just a few more items uh, before we wrap up today. On behalf of Master Gardeners and the West Sound Stormwater Outreach Group, I want to thank you all so much for being here and taking your time out of your evening. I hope you learned some new techniques for taking care of your lawn and maybe have been inspired to make some changes. To help you with that, we have partnered with six local retailers who are offering 25% off of natural lawn fertilizer. There's a QR code here on this screen that will take you to the website for the coupon. You can simply show the retailer your phone when you are at the checkout. Um, we will also send you an email with a link to a recording of today's presentation. Um, and as I said before, we have an evaluation at the end. We've got plenty of time um, for you to do that in this kind of hour that hopefully you've allotted for this webinar. Um, this is a really new program for us, and we are really hoping that it meets the needs of our residents of our cities uh, and of Kitsap County. And in order to do that, we really need your feedback. Um, so I would really appreciate it if you take a few minutes, shouldn't take that long for you to take the survey at the end. Um, also, we know that making changes to your lawn can take some time before you're really satisfied with how your lawn looks. Uh, so if you're interested, there's a spot in that survey where you can sign up for a follow-up for Master Gardeners and they'll email you in a few weeks and ask how it's going, um, ask if you've had any challenges or if there's anything that they can do to help you make that transition. Um, and last, oh, oh, okay, there's a question. I'm going to pause in my wrap-up, Bob, and we're going <laughs> to we're going to go to this question. Um, have you heard of micro clover? The person asks. I, I have heard of micro clover. I'll admit to you, I don't know a lot about it. Um, there was a, a lecture on lawn care that I was sitting in on, and one of the other uh, members of the audience talked about microclover being a, a very big thing lately. Uh, online, there's some options of getting different types of clovers, and that's about what I know about it. It's certainly an option to use, but it's uh, a lot smaller than the other types. Okay. Another question has popped in and feel free folks to keep dropping them into the Q&A if you want. Uh, this person says, I am new to the Pacific Northwest. Are there any natural minerals good for the soil in this area? I grew up in the Northeast and we would put lime on our lawn. Anything like that suggested for this region? So for natural minerals, I, I I'll say that our soils are naturally acidic. And it is common to have to add lime to your lawns to reduce the acidity to get into that 6.0 to 7.0 range. And I mentioned that biochar is one means where you can adjust acidity or help in that regard, but lime is the traditional means of doing that. I do highly recommend that you uh, test the soil to see where your pH is to see if it needs the lime application. Um, if the soil is if you're converting natural native soil to used to lawn, then you probably have to add lime. Or if you're on the edge of your forest, of a forested area, you may need to use lime. But if you're far from that area and it's an established lawn, it's probably a reasonable acidity right now. But please test first before you do that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, so somebody read my mind. I was going to ask if there are any more questions and it popped right in on my screen. Uh, this person asks, where can you get a soil test and how much is it? 
so there's a, a lot of different types of soil testers out there and the prices vary uh, considerably. There are some very simple tests that are just some plastic little test tubes and you can just take some soil and you put it in the test tube with some water and shake it and it will indicate the pH for you. And some of them will also indicate some nitrogen or some other basic um, soil nutrient levels. Those tests are available in most garden stores like nurseries or some of the other garden stores like your box stores and things like that. I, I, I can't recommend any specific stores or specific products, but those are out there. There are more advanced systems that are out there where like a pH probe, which has some probes, you can actually stick it in the soil. And some of these are um, to, to determine soil moisture levels and other ones to determine pH levels. And I, I think there are some more advanced ones out there, depending on how much you're willing to pay, you know, but, um, and a lot of that stuff can be gotten online or you can talk at your uh, local nursery or one of our uh, other nursery stores or garden centers. Okay. Uh, somebody, this is a great question, uh, mainly because it happens in my lawn. So <laughs> they ask, how do you naturally take care of crane flies? I, I would have to research that one. I, uh, let me think. Um, I, I don't know. I would have to research that more specifically. I, I know the, the simple answer is to produce, you know, the more you can do to produce your healthy, vigorous lawn, it can handle pests much better. And nature handles pests. It's a balance. And this is how plants survive. They can handle pests normally. But if they're stressed, then they're less likely to handle any other pests and problems going on. Specifically for crane flies, I would have to research that. I don't know. So I'll throw out there to this person as well that in that I had mentioned that I'll do a follow up email um, it'll have the link to the recording of this it'll have um, a link to the where you can get the coupon if you missed it for some reason during the presentation it will also have a link to the master gardener so you can always reach out to them and follow up with that question if you want more detail and that will give them some time to research and answer and get that back to you. I am not seeing any other questions so I'm going to go over my last little wrap up thing a little slowly in case anybody has any more that they're furiously typing out right now. Um, I mentioned that we've got a survey about today's webinar that's going to pop up when the webinar ends that we really appreciate your feedback on. I also want to give you a heads up that in a few months we'll be sending another follow up email with a different follow up survey, um, hoping to hear about anything that you may have implemented over the summer after this webinar. For those that take that end of summer uh, survey, we're actually offering $25 um, to all people who take it. So um, keep your eyes peeled uh, on your inbox toward the end of summer. I'm not seeing any other questions. So Bob, thank you so much for your time tonight. Everybody who attended, I really appreciate you being here too. Um, and we're going to uh, bring this to an end. Enjoy your evenings. Thank you, Cami. Thank you.